Many of you may have watched the masterpiece series Endeavor, which reveals the early life of fictional British detective Endeavor Morse. But how similar is Endeavor to real life? In series two, we are treated to a creepy finale involving a boy's home, Blenheim Vale. Blenheim Palace was the family palace of the Marlborough family, where Lady Caroline Lamb lived lover of Lord Byron. So already we see a British literary connection in the name, and you can learn more about Lady Caroline Lamb on this channel. What was Blenheim Vale in the show Endeavor? Blenheim Vale was a residential home for wayward boys that closed in 1955. In the episode Neverland, the Blenheim Vale property is being proposed by developer Joe Landisman and his powerful crony Alderman Gerald Wintergreen as the site of the new police headquarters. In Neverland, Endeavor and his girlfriend Monica go to a pantomime of Peter Pan at the new with her niece and nephew. This further sets the scene. When Morse and his supervisor, Detective Thursday, investigate the murder of an escaped prisoner who had been found beaten and drowned, their investigation unveils horrific sexual and physical abuse of the children then in residence by the very people, now pillars of Oxford society, charged with their protection. The home's director, Gerald Wintergreen, and developer Joe Landisman are discovered to have taken the boys to hotels and guest houses where unthinkable abuse occurred. In an attempt at revenge, a group of the boys blew up Wintergreen's car, and their ringleader, Big Pete, was taken away as punishment for this arson, never to return. When George Aldridge went to the police about this, he was accused of lying and the report was suppressed. Some of the abused boys made an all-for-one and one-for-all pact to convene within one week should any of them sense they were in danger throughout their lives. Years later, a journalist's investigation and subsequent murder into connections between Blenheim Vale and Landisman Construction put their pact into action. Little advertisements in the Oxford Mail served as the boys' communication to each other. The six boys were murder victim George Aldridge, ventriloquist Ben Topping, Edward Spencer, who later hanged himself because of the abuse, Henry Patmore, who later married Edward's sister Hillary, Big Pete Williams, and a young boy nicknamed Little Pete. So we have six boys in the show, George, Ben, Edward, Henry, Big Pete, and Little Pete. The repetitive Pete is noteworthy. The episode itself is called Neverland, and Peter Pan is referred to and the hero of such a paradise. Let's look at the parallels between these fictional boys and the real Llewellyn Davies boys who inspired Peter Pan. There were five Llewellyn Davies boys, born to Sylvia Llewellyn Davies in Edwardian England, George, Peter, Jack, Michael, and Nico. The George and Peter names overlap. There has been extensive scholarship on whether the Llewellyn Davies boys were abused by their guardian, J.M. Barry. The description of undressing boys in Barry's 1902 The Little White Bird novel is pretty shocking. Michael Llewellyn Davies suffered horrible nightmares and sleepwalked, which his cousins, the Du Mauriers, remembered. There were many trips alone to Scotland to hotels, another parallel with the Endeavor episode. In reminiscences by Michael Llewellyn Davies' friends, they described his relationship with Barry as morbid, and Barry, of course, was a pillar of society. The Oxford connection is also significant. Michael, George, and Nico Llewellyn Davies all attended Oxford. Henry Patmore in the show marries Edward's sister, Hilary. There was a rumored romance between Michael Llewellyn Davies and Audrey Lucas, the daughter of a family friend. Audrey would go on to have a romance with Evelyn Waugh, and he kept her books in his personal library, which were found after his death. In the Endeavor episode, another girl, Angela, not Audrey, but close, Fairchild, is drugged throughout her childhood by her doctor father to avoid understanding what she sees at Blenheim Vale. 
In real life, Audrey Lucas drank a lot when she was able to attain her own apartment in Soho in early adulthood, and she wrote a stinging biography of her father, E.V. Lucas, after his death. She accused her father of worshiping hidden bedroom gods. Endeavor Morse's investigation finds Henry and his wife Hillary living on the property at Blenheim Vale in a house that had belonged to the school's doctor. In order to conduct a historical dig, ostensibly to look for a Neolithic barrow, but actually they're in search of the body of Big Pete, Peter Williams, who they're convinced was killed and buried there. But the dig was shut down shortly after Landisman Construction acquired Blenheim Vale for development. Landisman Construction and Gerald Wintergreen. Let's look at these names. Gerald was the name of Sylvia Du Maurier's brother in real life, and Winter was the surname of Barry's nephew, Willie Winter, who was a minor chess champion in his day. And then with regards to Green, the first Wendy House appeared on stage in a 1904 production of Peter Pan. Playwright J.M. Barry needed a house that could be built quickly as these lyrics were sang on stage. I wish I had a darling house, the littlest ever seen, with funny little red walls and a roof of mossy green. As the case unspools in the TV show and the tension heightens, at a critical moment, Morse learns that his comrade D.S. Peter Jakes is Little Pete, a survivor of abuse at Blenheim Vale. Peter Llewellyn Davies would survive World War I and go on to compile the morgue, a collection of family papers by 1950, and so was also a survivor in his way. The morgue has never been published. In the episode, Morse eventually learns that it was ACC Clive Deer and his lackey D.I. Chard who had suppressed the investigation into the events at Blenheim Vale back in the day. Deer was part of the cover-up and conspiracy, and knowing he's in danger of exposure, spoiler alert, he tries to have Chard suit, shoot Morse. Chard, another interesting name. Chard is the name of a town near the Peter Pan Cup swimming race held by the Serpentine Swimming Club. Barry himself dedicated the silver trophy in 1903 to groups of boys in bathing suits. Back to the episode. Morse escapes and hightails it to Blenheim Vale, where Deer has lured Thursday into a trap. Deer appears, shoots Thursday, then reveals that he has set Morse up to take the fall, not just for shooting Thursday, but for strangling Chief Constable Standish. Before Deer is able to shoot Endeavor and frame him for the killings, Angela Fairchild, daughter of the school's doctor and herself a childhood victim of the abuse, steps out of the shadows and shoots Deer before turning the gun on herself. The episode ends with Morse behind bars and Thursday fighting for his life, as well as the entire case sealed for 50 years. Few would have seen the turn of D.S. Jakes in Endeavor. He's a buzzing fly in Morse's periphery and not a man to trust. The turning point in the series two finale when he was revealed to have been Little P was part of a theme where in the 1940s and 1950s, Blenheim Vale was the site of a brutal, brutal pedophile, pedophile ring. Um, pillars of the community, including a police officer, local politician, and philanthropic business owner, and the home's doctor, colluded in the physical and sexual abuse of vulnerable children at the home. This is a very interesting choice of plot for the show Endeavor. Blenheim Vale was considered such an important plot point, we see it return in Endeavor's final series seven years later at the end of series nine episode Uniform, where Blenheim Vale must be avenged. In the series two finale Neverland, Endeavor Morse escaped from an attempt on his life and realized that his superior, ACC Clive Deer, was at the heart of the Blenheim Vale cover-up. 
Endeavor attempted to gather the troops, recognizing the threat to DCI Thursday, who was waiting for Deer at the derelict boy's home. Jim Strange turned turncoat and refused to disobey orders, so Morse then tried Jake's, who buckled at the mention of Blenheim Vale. That's when Endeavor realized that Jake's was Little Pete, the missing part of the abuse survivor puzzle. To some of us bastards, it's more than just a name, Jake said about Blenheim Vale. You don't think of something for long enough. You think you're forgotten. Then one day somebody comes along. That somebody was ACC Deer, one of the pedophile ring who had brutally abused Jake's and his friends. As a child, Jake's had been tortured for the name of a fellow resident who had sought revenge on their abusers by torching their car. His guilt over the disappearance of his friend had kept him silent throughout the investigation. Jake says things like, Bloody place, it turns my guts, bleach, sweat, boiled cabbage, and everything on tick. Never, never land. Why never, never land? Is that a reference to J.M. Barry's Neverland and the Llewellyn Davies boys? The events of Blenheim Vale revealed corruption, secrets, and lies at the highest level of the police and in Oxford society. Thursday survived his injuries, Morse was eventually exonerated, and the shooting of Thursday was attributed to a mental breakdown suffered by ACC Clive Deer. But further investigations were deemed not in the matter of the national interest in the show, and the case was sealed. But the mystery of Barry pops up again and again with regards to missing and dead children. In 2010, the creator of Peter Pan was cleared of any link to the mysterious deaths of two babies in the 1930s after Los Angeles police discovered their mummified remains in a locked trunk, trunk belonging to a JMB or JM Barry. Barry signed his letters much of the time as JMB. The bodies of these two babies were discovered in August 2010 when two women were clearing out the abandoned basement of an apartment building near MacArthur Park in Los Angeles. When they came upon the old trunk, they broke its lock with a screwdriver. Inside was a trove of antique books and clothing and two leather doctor's satchels, each holding a small body. The corpses were wrapped in sheets and hidden in two doctor's bags among crumpled copies of 1930s newspapers and other belongings from that decade. J.M. Barry died in 1938. The only clue to the baby's identity was the name J.M. Barry on the steamer trunk's lid. Investigators from the coroner's office identified two women who had shared the same name. One had been a nurse, unrelated to Barry, and the other was an East Coast stage performer who was related to Barry. A copy of Peter Pan and membership papers for a local resort called Peter Pan Woodland Club, founded 1935, pointed investigators towards Barry. The Peter Pan Woodland Club was a members-only outdoor and recreational club in San Bernardino County. Membership to the club was obtained by purchasing a completed cabin or home site in the Big Bear City subdivision. In 1930, the subdivision boasted 20 miles of improved streets and electricity and water available to every lot. How would a single woman in 1930 have been able to afford this? The most captivating feature inside the majestic wooden clubhouse of the Peter Pan Woodland Club was a huge rock fireplace created by master sculptor Fred Humphrey. The rugged fireplace in the Grand Lounge was built of carefully selected black shale and quartz from nearby Rattlestake Canyon, Gold Mountain, and Arasta Creek. A small electric train ran through the miniature canyons and tunnels created by rock work in the fireplace. It sounds like a very similar attraction to Disneyland. The clubhouse also included a large dining room, additional lounges, coffee shop, gym, and movie theater. There were no guest rooms in the clubhouse, but cabins surrounded the facility could be rented by members only. The exterior of the clubhouse was lined with verandas and patios that provided views of the grounds and the surrounding forest. The large swimming pool was built in a unique figure eight shape. It was surrounded by concrete decking and a manicured lawn filled with chairs and umbrella covered tables. 
The grounds and facilities of the Peter Pan Woodland Club underwent continuous upgrades, and the list of members began to read like a who's who of celebrities and businessmen. Barry guarded the Peter Pan name very carefully, and so he must have approved the name, the Peter Pan Woodland Club, and perhaps visited it during his life. Tragedy struck the Woodland Club in June 1948 when an early morning fire destroyed the clubhouse. Everyone was able to escape and only one employee suffered minor injuries. Police investigating the discovery of the two babies explored the possibility of exhuming J.M. Barry's remains from his grave in Scotland to establish a DNA link with the dead infants, but this did not happen. Officials announced that after reading correspondence from relatives left in the trunk, they identified the trunk's owner as Janet M. Barry, a Scottish-born nurse who had worked in Los Angeles after her family immigrated to Canada when she was four years old. She was one of 13 siblings, while J. M. Barry was one of 10, and so they did not come from the exact same Barry family, but they may have been related. Miss Janet Berry, who was born in 1897, died in the mid-1990s, and police said they had found no connection between her and the author. Why did Janet Berry, who died in 1994, keep the bodies tucked among her possessions for so many years? Coroners were unable to determine how the two girl babies died, but said there was no signs of trauma or that they were aborted. One had apparently reached full term, while the other was much smaller and could have been a fetus or born prematurely. After examining immigration forms in the trunk and checking census records, investigators tracked down Miss Berry's nieces and nephews in Canada. Some agreed to submit DNA samples to see if they were related to the babies, and they were. The trunk, which had been stored unclaimed for decades, also contained postcards, books, and clothing. A police investigator said the correspondence suggested the owner was a single, independent type of woman, revealing her dressed in fancy clothes and posing with modern cars. Police said they had a duty to investigate the deaths because the babies could have been murdered. Justice, even when it's delayed, is still justice. Even when you have no one to speak for you, we will speak for you, said Charlie Beck, the chief of Los Angeles police. The building where the babies were found was the home of a dentist, George Knapp. Miss Barry worked for him in the 1930s, caring for his sick wife, Mary. When she died of breast cancer in 1964, Miss Barry married Mr. Knapp and stayed with him until his death four years later before moving to Vancouver. She would live for 27 more years. Did he give her the doctor's satchels for the babies? Their ashes are interred together at Forest Lawn Memorial Park of California. Among the theories examined by police is that Miss Barry had children with Mr. Knapp, but they did not survive or were aborted. Another possibility is that they were babies she helped deliver in the apartment building who later died. She lived in the apartment building started in 1948. When she was 14, the family immigrated to Diamond City, Alberta after her family saw an advertisement that said in Canada the streets were paved in gold. Despite her family's misgivings, she moved to Winnipeg and went to nursing school. She remem her relatives remember her saying, I showed them. Barry moved to Los Angeles in the 1920s. Although she stayed in touch by sending postcards and Christmas present, including an annual subscription to National Geographic magazine for her nephews and nieces, her life in the United States was a mystery to her family. Along with the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office, detectives examined other items found with the infants inside the steamer trunk. Materials in the trunk included two letters and several Christmas cards addressing to Jean M. Barry. But one letter was addressed to a Janet M. Barry and was apparently from a Thomas M. Barry, so we see changes in names in the trunk. A second letter addressed to Janet M. Barry was sent by another family member from Canada. The correspondences to both Jean M. Barry and Janet M. Barry were sent to the same address, meaning that it was probably to the same person. Other correspondence from family members addressed to Jean M. Barry referenced a Janet within the body of the letters, so maybe they were two different people. Using official Scottish documents and U.S. immigration records, detectives confirmed that Janet Manberry and Jean M. Barry were the same person. 
To help detectives and personnel from the coroner's office determine Barry's connection to the trunk's contents, investigators used photos and negatives showing the woman um, in a uh, white fox boa and holding a purse. Coroner investigators say the baby's bodies were dressed in clean silken garments, and these silken garments were too clean to contain all of the girl's decomposing remains, suggesting that the babies had both been wrapped and unwrapped several times in clean garments. It suggests the children, despite their outcome, were loved, a long-lost relative living in Canada said. However, without DNA from her husband, George Knapp, it remains a mystery who fathered the two girls. In an interview with Endeavor writer Russell Lewis from 2023, he stated, Well, I always do my best not to give too much away. It's in Neverland, when Morris and Thursday are trapped at Blenheim Vale and waiting for deer, that Morris recites part of the A.E. Houseman poem, How Clear, How Lovely Bright. This poem appeared in a book called The Shropshire Lab, furthering the theme of boyhood. And again, we see a play on names, since Bright is also the name of Endeavor's superior. Here it is. How clear, how lovely bright, how beautiful to sight those beams of morning play. How heaven laughs out with glee, where like a bird set free, up from the eastern sea, soars the delightful day. Today I shall be strong, no more shall yield to wrong, shall squander life no more, days lost, I know not how, I shall retrieve them now. Now I shall keep the vow I never kept before. In sanguining the skies, how heavily it dies into the west away, past touch and sight and sound, not further to be found, how hopeless underground falls the remorseful day.